Good afternoon. Welcome to anyone that is just joining us, and welcome back to the rest of you. I know you've been having an incredible day. On behalf of the Tishman Environment and Design Center, the Center for New York City Affairs, and the New School, I'd like to thank you again for being here today as we join the Parks Department in thinking about the future of parks and public space in New York City. TEDC, as we like to call the Tishman Center, is a university-wide center that fosters the integration of bold design, policy, and social justice, the approaches to environmental issues that advance just and sustainable outcomes in collaboration with communities. After this morning's great panel and breakouts, I'm sure you can all understand why we are so proud to be co-hosting today and engaging in a conversation focused on themes that resonate deeply with the mission and vision of TEDC. Community collaboration. Achieving shared goals for health, the environment, resilience, and accessibility, and building a more just and equitable city. This afternoon, I have the distinct honor of introducing our second keynote speaker, Paul Goldberger, who has spent his career engaging the subject of architecture, design, historic preservation, and cities. Paul brings his perspective as a Pulitzer Prize winning leading figure in architecture criticism to bear on this discussion of the future of parks and public space without borders. Paul has spent his career examining the complex fabric of New York City. He's been thinking about architecture as being about more than just buildings, but also culture and community. He's been contemplating physical space in a city as inextricable from values like equity and sustainability, and considering the function and evolution of cities over time. Here at the New School, Paul is a professor that teaches a course in the Parsons School of Design called Reimagining the City. I think we're all in for a very special Parks edition of that class. I know I can't wait for it, and I hope you're all excited to hear about his ideas for the next generation of urban parks. Please help me welcome Paul Goldberger. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's great to be here, uh, especially to uh, be able to deliver a talk for which I not only don't have to get on an airplane, I don't even have to get on a subway. Um, and I'm especially excited about uh, anything that furthers the alliance between the New School and Parsons and the Parks Department. For years, uh, one of the proudest projects at Parsons has been the Summer Design Workshop at Parsons. And for many years, there have been some great projects done for the Parks Department. So now this partnership is getting a whole new realm of joint intellectual inquiry between Parks and the new school. And I'm very grateful to Commissioner Silver and his colleagues for making all this happen. I want to say a few things about the role of public space in the city, <clears throat> about how it's evolved and changed, and about what the public realm can and should mean in our time. For the first few minutes, I'm not going to say much specifically about parks, but I promise I'll get into them very soon. And I won't talk very much at all about buildings, about architecture, even though, of course, it too is part of the public realm. But it matters less to our concerns today, because if there's anything I've learned in many decades as an architecture critic, it's that in a city, the street and the public space is much more important than the buildings. Can we have the first image, please? I know that sounds counterintuitive for an architecture critic to say, maybe it's even heresy, but so be it. To make a city work, you need great streets and great public space. You do not actually need great buildings, wonderful and appealing and powerful though they can be. They're the exclamation points in a sentence, but you cannot talk only in exclamation points, and in any case, you need a lot of ordinary letters and words to make a sentence work before the exclamation point is going to have any impact. If you have good streets and good public spaces and you have enough density, then the quality and the individual 
pieces of architecture is actually secondary. The downtowns in this country that really work, New York, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, are all downtowns that have significant density. Density means two different things, and you need both of them. It means a lot of people living in city neighborhoods, and it means a downtown that is a dense web of buildings without vacant lots and parking lots. It's built up because there is a demand to be there. In a strong downtown, the only open space is intentional open space, open space designed as public space, not leftover space that no one wants. I'll come back to that, to the question of intentional open space in a minute, since it's inextricably connected to the idea of the street. The great architect Louis Kahn once said that the street is a room by agreement. And that extraordinary, poetic, and profound line says a huge amount, because the very idea behind it, the metaphor between the street and a room, the idea of calling the street a kind of room underscores the fact that the street is a public space. And it's a public space in which architects have to observe a kind of social contract, acknowledging each other's work as they build new buildings and restore old ones. That's the agreement. It's an agreement between those of us who walk on the street and experience the life of this urban room, and also an agreement between architects often of different generations and different eras who build the street over time. In a city like New York, much of the power of this urban room comes from how much the streets feel full and active. It's not obviously true only of New York, although New York embodies the notion of the street as public space as well, if not better, than any other city in the country. But this past weekend, I was in Los Angeles, where I noticed what will astonish some people, but what I've seen bit by bit emerging over the last few years, which is the increasing presence of people actually on the sidewalks and bicyclists on the streets. All signs of a very different way of perceiving the city and engaging with it. It's astonishing in the city that once celebrated the private realm over the public realm is now beginning to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a public realm, and it wants one. A few weeks ago, I was in Chicago, a city certainly of more traditional urbanism than Los Angeles, and the sidewalks of North Michigan Avenue were so crowded you could barely navigate your way along them. The amazing thing, though, was that this pedestrian congestion was never annoying like traffic congestion. It was exhilarating. I was actually even frustrated because when I reached my destination, I really wanted to keep walking. And in fact, I did. I was, uncharacteristically for me, a few minutes early. I walked around the corner off Michigan Avenue and suddenly found myself in quiet streets surrounded by elegant apartment buildings with people walking dogs in a beautiful park or along the lakefront. Now, what made all this work was not the architecture of Chicago, great as it is. It was all of the lesser buildings and the storefronts, and the energy. Then again, just so no one leaves here and says that Paul Goldberger says that architecture no longer matters, I do want to make clear before we move on that if a successful downtown doesn't owe everything to its architecture, that is not to say that the architecture is not a key factor in the experience and identity of a city. Bad architecture can cripple downtown, it can destroy streets, and it can compromise public space. Ideally, every building will contribute at least a little bit to making life better. We know, of course, that not all of them do, and far too many of them make life worse. Every building has an obligation to the larger whole. And this, I think, is the second fundamental principle of urban design, after the street is more important than the building. It's the urban whole is larger than the sum of its parts. For a city to work, architects need to feel as if they're designing a section of a much larger composition, a composition that began long before them and will continue long after them, and that however different their work may be from what adjoins it, they cannot design as if the other buildings were not there. For many New Yorkers, for much of our city's history, the street 
was the only public space there was. We all know about stickball in the streets, about east side, west side, the sidewalks of New York, and so forth and so on. That lyric is not just a sentimental evocation of the city of 100 years ago. It's a reminder of how, for New Yorkers of modest means, the street was usually the only public realm there was. They lived in cramped tenements, where there was no sense of pleasure in the private realm. Your home was not a place to escape to, but something to escape from. And you escaped generally into the street, since that was shared space, recreational space, social space. Now, this is not the place to, and we don't have the time today to recount the whole history of public space in New York, but we all know how there were only modest breaks in the great grid of 1811 for a tiny handful of squares. The presumption was that the streets were sufficient public space or that it didn't matter very much since the affluent and the powerful had private space to retreat to and the needs of those who did not have meaningful private space were barely thought to matter. All of this began to change in the mid-19th century when the movement began to create a major public park space and Olmsted and Vaux's extraordinary and brilliant Greensward design for Central Park changed the concept of public space forever, suggesting that it was fundamentally democratic in concept and that it had a social mission as well as a purely landscape-oriented one. We all know that Central Park is one of the greatest achievements of urban design and of American urbanism ever. That goes without saying, especially in this room. But emerging as it did out of the environment of 19th century New York and out of the Emersonian thinking of that period, it was also based on the notion that the greatest gift the park could give was a sense of connection to nature and a feeling of being removed from the city. It is a work of genius, and yet it is based on the precept that the city is something we need to escape from, not something we would want to celebrate. Now, the Arcadian ideal is understandable enough, given the nature of life in the 19th century, which, as I've said, most people experienced as harsh, dirty, and dangerous, very different from our, ide our ideal of the city today as a benign mixture of people and visual stimulation. For most people in 19th century New York, that notion was laughable. Indeed, I think that for many people in the 20th century, that notion was equally laughable. It's very easy to forget now how well, how unbenign, you could say, the public space, the parks, and the streets of New York were as recently as the 1960s and 1970s. Charles Birnbaum reminded us of this vividly this morning. In any event, whether because urbanity seemed so challenging or because of the lack of an alternative model, for at least a century after its completion, Central Park's Arcadian model held sway over the idea of public open space. Even the smallest local parks were seen as places in which the goal was to help you disconnect from the city. Not for nothing were most parks, beginning with Central Park, surrounded by fences or walls. In the case of Central Park, most other, and I suspect most other fenced-in parks, it was less to keep people out than to draw a firm, unequivocal line of demarcation between the benign, natural realm of the park and the mean, rough streets of the city. If you were escaping, you needed to escape across a border, and the wall of Central Park was a clear and absolute border. Contrast the separation of Central Park with the sense of connection of, say, the piazzas and plazas and squares of European cities, which were open spaces for public gathering that were not based at all on the presence of nature and that were almost invariably integrated seamlessly into the pattern of streets around them. Rome does not stop at the edge of the Piazza Navona. Paris does not stop at the Place de la Concorde, or even, for that matter, the Tuileries or the Jardin de Luxembourg. 
The tiny piazzas that are so vital to the life of every Italian hill town are places in which urbanity flows in and out. And if anything, it is there in those public spaces that the city life feels even more intense. The best piazzas represent urbanism ratcheted up to the 10th power. For most of our history in New York, we've never been particularly inclined towards such seamless blends of the idea of the street and the idea of public open space. While we've always called Times Square and Herald Square and Lincoln Square and Columbus Circle public spaces, they've only recently begun to evolve into places worthy of the name. Since only recently have they been reworked so that it's been possible to sit and linger and watch the world pass by. Columbus Circle now really is a kind of piazza. You see it on the right, albeit one on an island. Until recently, though, it was nothing but an empty island in a sea of swirling traffic. But in general in New York, we have streets and intersections, and then we have parks, and never the twain shall meet. While we do call some places in New York squares, historically we really haven't had real public squares in the European sense. We do, of course, have a huge inventory of privately operated public spaces, many of which have elements that aspire to the qualities of European squares, but few of which actually achieve them. The best of them is surely the simple, austere, and beautifully proportioned plaza in front of the Seagram Building on Park Avenue, which is now almost 60 years old. But the story of our private public spaces, most of which are nowhere near as good as Seagram, is another story for another day. For now, I want to stay with the truly public and think about what we want from those places that we experience as parks or that we call parks. We do now have a different sense of public spaces and parks, a sense that takes us well beyond what we might call the Olmstedian, Arcadian model. I think it began, strangely enough, ironically enough, with the work of Robert Moses, of all people, in two different but related ways. First, in his determination to build playgrounds and public swimming pools in so many New York City parks, which suggested a view of the park as more active and less aspiring to be natural, and second, with the brilliant design for the Brooklyn Heights promenade, a public open space that, while it offers a view that could only exist in New York, is in many ways more European, since it sends a message that we can have shared public open space that is about movement and connection to the city, not about escape into nature. And it's only a simple leap from there to the waterfront esplanade at Battery Park City one of the key achievements of New York urban design of the 1980s, and then a greater leap to the high line of our time. But the lineage is there. The high line represents the new paradigm. Public space as promenade, as at Brooklyn Heights, but this time even more engaged with the city. On the high line, you slip in and around and through the city, looking at it from a hundred different angles. You move through the city, and while the landscape and the plantings are exquisite, they're not intended to evoke escape into the rural. If anything, the fact that so much of the landscape is inspired by the wild landscape that grew up naturally on the High Line during its years of abandonment suggests that even the natural aspect of this public space is intended to evoke a kind of urban history. Our other major parks, the Hudson River Park, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Park at Governor's Island, not to mention the various East River waterfront areas, bespeak a similar sense of engagement, not disengagement with the city. They do it in different ways, but the goal is never to create an illusion of rusticity, the sense that we have left the city. The city is always present. The purpose of the park is not to take the city out of our consciousness not to give us the illusion that we are somewhere else, but to change our feeling of what the city can be. These new parks make us aware of the city and its potential to engage, to inspire, to bring us together, to stimulate us. And they make us aware, I think, that to do these things, to be stimulated, 
to enjoy the experience of shared common space, to feel a part of a community, is something that an urban park is uniquely positioned to do. I say all of this not to diminish the role of nature or to take issue with Olmsted and Vaux, whose belief in the park is a physical manifestation of the democratic ideals of this country as a true commonweal, continues to inspire us and is in many ways the philosophical basis for the social ideas underlying parks without borders. It will always be the case that all park design derives to some extent from Olmsted. And it is part of his genius that his 19th century vision continues to work so brilliantly today, serving as the same kind of mixing chamber for New York's diverse population that he envisioned it to be in the 1860s. I once wrote that the greatest works of architecture in New York were two things that were not buildings at all, Central Park and the Brooklyn Bridge. And I still believe that. Come to think of it, I should have mentioned the Brooklyn Bridge earlier, not only because it was opened on May 24th, 1883, <laughs> but also because the elevated pedestrian walkway in its center could probably be considered the real beginning of the blending of park, public open space, and street. More than half a century before the Brooklyn Heights promenade, the bridge walkway was giving people the same experience of going from one place to another, a place in itself, a new kind of public open space, even though probably no one realized it at the time. So where do we go with all this? I think the blurring of the distinction between the park and the other kinds of public space we have, the square, the street, is going to continue, and it's all to the good. We want squares and open spaces, and their designs do not need to be driven wholly by the desire to bring us into the illusion that we are out of the city. I'm not sure that I wouldn't rather see more trees lining our streets than more open spaces at the borders of our parks. To think of parks without borders can also be to let the park rush out into the street. It is not only to have the city rush into the park. We should be bringing the park to the street as well as bringing the street to the park. Not the least of the great things about Central Park, by the way, is the fact that it is surrounded by a sidewalk of special pavers, different from the other sidewalks, that serves as a kind of mediating zone between it and the rest of the city. Because of this, it's really not as rigid a border as we might think, um, but a more subtle one than the fact of a wall might suggest. So, in a way, the original park without borders is, in fact, Central Park. The other day I was thinking about this, just to conclude, when I was looking at another park I visit often in my Upper West Side neighborhood, Theodore Roosevelt Park around the Museum of Natural History, which is a park with very clear borders. Much too clear, in fact, since the entire 77th Street side of the park is entirely fenced off. It's really nothing more than a private enclosed lawn in front of the museum, totally inaccessible. Pretty much all of that park's areas are fenced in, but at least on the north side, there are walkways lined with benches. On the south side, however, the park is solely for looking into, not for entering at all. It's a very strange definition of public space and of the public realm, something the public gets to look at only through a fence. It's the absolute antithesis of the park without borders. Unlike Central Park, Theodore Roosevelt Park really is the park with walls, the park intended to keep us out. That's antithetical, I would suggest, to the spirit of New York. We believe in parks without borders because we believe in a city without borders. A city of openness, a city of diversity, a city that believes in growth and change, and a city that believes that the genius of urban life is in the creativity it inspires, creativity that emerges as much out of people encountering each other as any other factor. Keeping people out contradicts everything a park and a city should be about, which is to encourage connection. The city, by its very nature, does exactly that. It enables connection. You could say that a well-functioning city, to give it a new metaphor for our time, is sort of like the internet. It's the potential of the internet realized in physical terms 
a collection of hyperlinks in real space and real time, since the way connections are made in the city is not linear, but can seem almost random, and often is. The greatest gift the city can give us is to facilitate human interaction. And public space is the stage on which human interaction takes place. The city is a vast machine for mixing, and its public spaces are its mixing valves, we could say, if I can move to a metaphor of the machine age. And that's what happens on the streets as it should in all of our public spaces. Encounter is what the public realm is all about. And while we will always want our parks to be places in which the joys and beauties of nature define much of our experience, Mumford's, the, this is true of parks as much as streets. We may go to the park to seek quiet and solitude, but we can seek those things on the street as well. The presence of nature as a defining element of a park does not make the park any more a place of isolation from the city than the street. The point is that parks are not a thing apart from the city, no matter how breathtaking their trees and flowers may be. They are as embedded in the identity of the city as any street or any skyscraper. That is the real belief between the idea of parks without borders, that the park should not be not just in the city, but of the city, and that it enrich every aspect of city life for every one of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're supposed to have a couple of questions. I ran a couple of minutes over, so I, don't, I guess we have time for one or two, if, uh, but not, not quite as many. I apologize. If there are any questions, happy to take them. Just uh, wait for someone with a mic to come your way. Um, over there. Yes, sir. Hi, Paul. Adrian Benepe. So you talked a lot about New York. What are some other great cities in the world besides the Roman piazzas you can point to with great park life? Uh, other cities with a great park life. Um, you know, there are, there are increasing numbers of cities with great park life. Chicago certainly is. Um, Los Angeles is trying to have one, but is, I think, a very, very, very long way from having one other than the beach, which is, an, in effect, a kind of park for Los Angeles. Um, San Francisco, to some extent. Um, London. Uh, but I do think the European model remains the most convincing and the most potent. And I find it fascinating that we actually only recently have begun to learn from it and use it. Um, you know, we began with this idea. We actually followed another European model initially, which is uh, London, where the parks really are breathtakingly beautiful, but very much intended as places of retreat from the city. Um, I think the, the brilliance of Olmsted is that Central Park and Prospect Park work both ways. You know, they, they, they are places of democratic engagement, and the social ideal that motivated him continues to underscore our somewhat different set of ideas today um, in terms of rusticity and the desire to remo remove oneself or the, remove oneself from, from the city. Um, but we are, I think, I see many cities that are increasingly moving toward a new model of park as public space and a blurring of the distinction. Millennium Park in Chicago is probably as clear an example of that as, as there is, um, of, of what I referred to as you know, the new paradigm in which the distinction between the park as a rustic escape and the public square has been blurred intentionally blurred. Um, and yet, uh, okay, thank you all very much again. Thank you. Okay. Please welcome Chief of Staff to the Chairman at City and Chairman of New Yorkers for Parks, Joel Steinhaus. Hello everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Joel Steinhaus, pleasure to be here. I work at City. You may have heard us uh, heard about us. We do the City Bike. 
and the city field, but we're also a bank. That's good, okay, good. Still awake. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited because I'm representing two New York organizations that have a long heritage in supporting parks, public spaces, and cities. I'm chair of New Yorkers for Parks, the citywide nonprofit that has advocated for quality parks and open space for all New Yorkers across all five boroughs for over 100 years. We understand that our open space serve many functions. I didn't realize that I did this. Sorry, here we go. Uh, we understand that our open spaces serve many functions. They are family reunion retreats, gymnasiums, health clinics, therapist offices, business incubators, stormwater mitigation areas, and core infrastructure. They are town halls, town squares, they are our backyard and our front yard. As we all know, this story does not tell itself, so at New York's for Parks, we conduct research that underpins the case we make. We can then develop tangible policy recommendations around our findings and plant the seeds of our ideas through advocacy and outreach across all five boroughs. In fact, tomorrow at 10 a.m., if you're interested, New Yorkers for Parks will be on the steps of City Hall with Council Member Mark Levine and others rallying for more public dollars for our parks and open spaces, so please join us if you're interested. I'm also here on behalf of City. As a global company which has called New York City home for over 200 years, City cares about the prosperity of cities all around the world. Cities are facing unprecedented growth. More than 100 million people are moving to cities each year. And this rapid growth causes significant challenges. There are strains on infrastructure, transportation, and energy. And as cities grow, the challenges of quality and sufficient parks and open spaces intensify. But cities are also where the challenges to these problems will be solved. Through our City for Cities initiative, we partner with governments, businesses, nonprofits, and citizens to identify and implement innovative solutions that support the growth of cities around the world from fin financing needed infrastructure projects like a new central terminal at LaGuardia Airport, to being the top lender of affordable housing in the US, to our landmark $100 billion investment in sustainable growth and in infrastructure, to supporting innovative civic projects like the Low Line, which is attempting to develop a first of, its first of its kind underground park right here on the Lower East Side. City is invested in making cities more livable. Through my involvement with New Yorkers for Parks and working at City, I know that the best solution will only come through strong collaboration across sectors, which is why City is so pleased to support today's event. And to, to hear more about the need for collaboration and innovative ideas, I'm pleased to introduce our next two speakers. Fred Kent, who I uh, realize now is a former City banker, is the founder and president of the Project for Public Spaces. He's a leading authority on revitalizing city spaces, and he'll perhaps shed some light on how we need to think differently about how we create, plan, and experience urban life. All, we'll also hear from Mike Lydon from the Street Plans Collaborative. He's a recognized urban planner. Mike will speak about how citizens are finding new ways to connect with parks and open spaces at very different scales and in very different ways. Uh, Fred said to me that he wanted a short intro, and I'm sorry about the outing you as a city banker, Fred, uh, but it's the, the images that tell the story is what he said. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Fred Kent to the stage. Uh, so this is a real pleasure, and, and Mitch, you're a superstar, and uh, Paul, you're a treasure, <laughs> you really are. Uh, there's so many extraordinary people in New York City that uh, are, many of you are here, and how to shape the future of the city is something that I know we're all interested in. Uh, I started working with William Holly White, Holly White, over 40 years ago, and uh, we were set up to apply his work outside of New York City. And since then, I have traveled uh, over five million miles uh, working in cities all over the world. One of the ones that we're working in now is Los Angeles. And Paul, you'll like this because uh, we have been part of a, of, of a resource team and we developed a program for a competition where the winner was just announced two weeks ago. And it was all about creating a square, not a park. And the people who submitted, many people, firms that you would know, it's a $50 million project, were people who were proposing parks. And we had a program for a square. So a square, a park without a border. So uh, this is the winner. And it turns out that they are from France, from Paris, actually, which is a city that has been able to do that in many, many different ways. 
So I believe there's a kind of a paradigm shift going on. As we move beyond the border of a park, we probably need to move beyond the disciplines that have been promoting and developing parks in this country. So we would talk more about how you create multi-use destinations where landscape design, architecture, industrial design, all of these different skills together can create a multi-use destination that draws people in and actually creates environments and jobs and, and equity that we can't always do with the kind of, kind of siloed disciplines that we have been uh, supporting. So for the past three years, we've working, been working with the UN Habitat and a foundation in uh, Sweden uh, doing something called the future of place and the future of places. Uh, it's been really uh, a revelation. Uh, Habitat 3 is coming up uh, in October. We're doing a placemaking week in Vancouver the month before, 40 years after the first uh, Habitat 1. Uh, and place and placemaking is really the idea that is going to move forward countries around the world, and to us, and to this group of people, the UN Habitat and the Foundation, we came up with this whole discussion about public spaces, place, and placemaking. And that can move, mobilize entire communities, cities, add a purpose and foundation to people's lives, create ownership and shared value, can allow local wisdom and common sense to thrive. It's community-based, holistic, and inclusive. And you can get these outcomes quickly, and I'm going to show you uh, how that can work and how we've been doing it. Uh, there's a, thing, a term we, we, we borrowed from an old friend uh, who started something called Lighter, Quicker, Cheaper. Uh, and he's from London. And then Eldon Scott here for the DeKalb Market did that here. And that is my view of one of the great public spaces that we have had here, a very short-lived one. So there's a kind of a convergence around the idea of place. It's a big movement that's growing rapidly around the world. It's not a movement that replaces anything. It adds to all of these uh, other very critical agendas. So if you take climate change and sustainability, place adds something to it. Local food systems. We have a big market program. And how you create local businesses in, in communities. We, we've been do we did something uh, with the UN last year on market cities that, that we could take the, the local markets here and expand them to be diversified by people in those communities to create jobs around those existing local, uh, local markets. It's a big opportunity for the inclusion that we're all looking for. We've worked all over the world, 46 countries, 1,000 cities, 3,000 communities, uh, and it's growing exponentially. We have a big partnership with Brookings uh, on innovation and placemaking, and we're moving that from just innovation districts down to community hubs, so it'll be a whole range of ways of creating centers of activity, especially around uh, sort of dynamically creating innovations within small communities and neighborhoods uh, on, at every level in small towns as well. The whole idea of placemaking has grown phenomenally. Uh, we, there are about 90,000 people that follow us on our various uh, uh, Twitter accounts. We have a similar rise in the Facebook and our emails as well. So placemaking is a community process. It's really a sacred process. It's organic. It localizes. It's economic development. It's scaled to each community. It creates social and place capital. All of these qualities we're all seeking. We're talking about it heard it many, many times here. And the outcomes are the inclusive, healthy, sustainable, and viable communities. I'm going to talk a little bit about and show you examples where, as we, a long time ago, Kathy Madden is here, we wrote a book called How to Turn a Place Around, Levin Principles. The first principle is the community is the expert. The second one is you're creating a place, not just a design. The third one is you can't do it alone, and it goes on. Uh, but we have seen all over the place that these project-driven or design-led, discipline-led, do not deliver the outcomes that the wisdom and creativity of people in a community can do. So this is one in Canada. This is an award-winning landscape design award. Uh, it also won the architectural award for this building. Uh, you may not know that this building is a water treatment facility. Uh, no one else does. Uh, this is the playground that they built. Uh, it's a cutting-edge design, award-winning, as they say. 
Uh, the black stones are in one sec section, and the white stones, uh, the benches are all lined up perfectly. And this little kid came in, uh, parents got out of the car, came over, and he started moving the black stones over to the white stones. <laughs> parents got a little upset by that, moved the, the black stones back to where they belong, and left. Then another couple came in, uh, and they had two children, thank God, uh, because they had, there were only one swing in each of those sections. So this won an award. Uh, I'm not sure why, but not too far from that, there was a park, and this is a park, that was, under, was abusively used. The woman who, who really did this, uh, exorc this uh, activation uh, talked about the tufts that were in the park that kept people from going into the park. So she started organizing. And the first thing she did with the tufts is built a bread oven. It may be the only bread oven in a park anywhere. Uh, and then, this is one of the events, this is her daughter, uh, and they built a kitchen <laughs> in the park. Have you ever seen anything like that? Doesn't go in any book that a parks department would put in. <laughs> but it's the gathering place for the people in that community. It's theirs. They did it. It belongs to them. Uh, and then this is their theater. It's a little amphitheater between <laughs> a path and some sloped, and it's a wonderful place to go. And then this is the playground. You can never imagine a better playground because it's all about uh, mud and dirt and, uh, and everyone is in there playing. Uh, and there's a little trickle of water and you can imagine what happens there. But they have made this whole place theirs. Uh, and it's the contrast between an award-winning one and one created by a community and the creativity is just phenomenal. So let's go to Perth. Uh, we were working in Perth at the same time Lincoln Center was being redone. Uh, these are very important museums and state library. This is the plan from the air. Uh, we did an activation plan in 2009 uh, and we left. Uh, this is a community activation plan. Uh, we left and we came back two years later and this is what it was like before, mostly these brutalist buildings. Uh, this is after, uh, before, uh, after, uh, after, uh, before, after, after, before, after, after, after. So uh, the, what was so surprising to us and so actually uh, our, we were very happy about it is that, that when we came back they hadn't done anything that we had put into the plan that they had given, uh, which was great because what they did is something much better. So each idea they took and gestated. So I would say that design is a critical part of this, but the programming was say 50% of that being design was what make that work, made that work to become the biggest destination uh, in Western Australia. So Lincoln Center, you know, this is a place you can sit under the trees in a chair and you can sit under the trees in a chair. Uh, here, you can sit on the roof, or you can sit in one of the five tables under that roof. And here, you can look at the water, but you can't touch it. So supposing you had this, instead of a fountain just to look at, and instead of this, you had this, you'd have a much more dynamic destination. So the idea of architectural as object, as icon, as an award, is something we should look at extremely seriously. So when you focus on place, you do everything differently. And we use something called the power of 10 as we wander around the world, and how New York has changed fundamentally uh, over the past 40 years after we started working. One of our jobs was to work on, on Bryant Park and, um, and uh, the Port Authority bus terminal with Emily Lloyd and, uh, and Times Square with Tim Tompkins. Uh, but if you take a, a city with 10 major destinations and each destination has 10 places within it and each of those places has 10 things to do, you have multiple reasons for being in that place and you go there many, many times. If it's just an object to look at, how often do you go there? So these are the places we worked in. Today these are major destinations as we all know. Uh, the power of 10 uh, is a very big idea. 
and you can take it down to the street level, like our neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, but we did it in Detroit, uh, and been working all over Detroit over the last 10 years. Uh, and placemaking is the agenda that Detroit adopted uh, about four years ago. When uh, and this is what Detroit looked like in uh, 1917. And this was in 1999 when we started working on something called Campus Martius, which was put in here. Uh, and we announced a placemaking initiative with Dan Gilbert, uh, who, who runs Quicken Loans and has bought a good part of downtown Detroit. In uh, 2013, uh, this is what it was like then. Uh, this was the vision that we created with them. And we implemented it in three months. Uh, much of the plan, and it's continuing to go on and grow. One of the things we did is with Southwest Airlines, who paid for this, we put a beach in the center of downtown the same month that Detroit went bankrupt. Uh, and of course, a beach is a, the, one of the most inclusive kinds of uh, public spaces you can put anywhere, uh, and having games, uh, lighter, quicker, cheaper type activations, a temporary basketball court, uh, and this is Dan Gilbert playing music. Uh, so the strategy for implementation, lighter, quicker, cheaper, uh, create energetic anchors of activity, crowdsource ideas through social media, which is what happens every day. I get an email from, uh, or a text with what they're doing in Detroit as the next agenda of placemaking. Make it a movable piece, feast, get people and products out on the street, and bring the inside out. And that's what makes these great public spaces. Now, coming back to New York, we have this Brooklyn Bridge Park, Pier 6, where there was no community engagement. And we have a series of walls. We have walls that are forests or trees. And then we have basically a psychological wall. As you come down Atlantic Avenue, you see this big uh, facade of trees that bring you into this space. And then there are these little cul-de-sacs that you can't really do much in, it, in them. We had a community plan that we did uh, right after we saw this plan, and we had 125 people from the community come and do this plan in three hours. It's not hard to do these things, but this could have made a great destination at the end of Atlantic Avenue that would have been a major economic driver and job creator and a connect and connection from inner Brooklyn all the way to the, to, out to the, uh, into the water and, and out into the harbor. So, and here's another one. If we could only have gotten this building uh, to become open and, and engaging instead of having a bank there, uh, even Citibank, <laughs> you know, you could have put Citibank up on the second floor and on the corners, but the whole bottom of the building could have been alive. Uh, but this whole square, uh, Astor Place, only it has three drugstores and, and a Starbucks. It'll never be the square that we could make it. So when you focus on place, you do everything differently. And just quickly, I'll go through the traffic idea. When you design your community around cars, and we have a very good transportation department here that needs a boost and needs to be able to move beyond just the plaza program, which I'm, I know they're doing, uh, but also embracing the much, broader, uh, the much broader agenda that we're all looking for. Uh, so this is a, a fellow that worked in North Holland and this is, he took an intersection like this and ended up like that. And this is a kind of shared space idea which, uh, which uh, Paul was talking about. And what he said is if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, build a village. And it means the transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual in the community. That's a big deal. Very bold. Uh, and you can, and this is in Buenos Aires where we had one of our conferences. Uh, and this is a, a street that during the morning is pretty, uh, a lot of fast moving traffic, but as lunchtime comes around, uh, the cars start slowing down, people start coming, that person couldn't walk on the sidewalk, so walked in the street, and it becomes a destination. And then after lunch, it goes back to traffic, and then at night, it goes back to a public space. So we can think of intersections as public spaces. So the whole idea of placemaking is how you create that vision, communicate it, search for the impediments, organize strong teams, attack complacency, produce short-term wins, take on bigger challenges, and connect to the change, the, to, the, to the culture of the community. And that's what I think we all need to do as a city, 
is to begin to go beyond the borders, think more holistically about each neighborhood and how each neighborhood can come alive, how people in those neighborhoods can be part of that growth in those public spaces, can establish themselves, their businesses, uh, their identity in those places. Uh, and this is a major paradigm shift. So we have to turn everything upside down to get it right side up, to get from inadequate to extraordinary. And we believe that is the city of the future. Thank you very much. This is our placemaking week. Hello, good afternoon, how are you? Doing well? This is a huge honor for me to, to follow Fred and, and Paul, and thanks to Mitch uh, for having me here today. Um, before I tell you about some of the work that we do, I want to learn more about you. How many uh, park designers or planners do we have in the room? All right. How about uh, engineers? A few. Lawyers? All right. Bankers? Urban planner, urban designers? All right. How about park activists? You should all raise your hands. Come on. All right. Um, so Street Plans, our company, uh, is based in, I'm based in here in Brooklyn. We have offices in San Francisco and Miami. We do a lot of planning and design projects with cities and citizens around the country, but we also do a lot of research and advocacy. So that's a bit more about what I'm talking about today and how we infuse the research and advocacy into helping communities shape their public spaces. Uh, oftentimes we work with groups like Transportation Alternatives or others around the country and try to reimagine what a space like uh, Sixth Avenue could look like with some changes that are more friendly to people. Um, so balancing out how we use those spaces is obviously critically important. But you know, once you've created these plans and you've created these renderings and you have that vision that's set, or you hope that it's set, you know, how do you actually make real change, right? In New York, that means we go to the community boards, <laughs> which in experience is something like this. Um, but this is not just New York and not just New York community boards. This is a challenging uh, situation that we face as planners when we work all over the country. And it's largely this system of planning that we've set up that means that 80% of our plans aren't implemented. Now that number probably changes from place to place, but this is part of the, the, the conversation that we have a lot with communities is how do we get over this hump? How do we bring city and citizen together to help transform these spaces to be more inclusive? And so as Jane Jacobs once wrote, uh, we lack tactics for building cities that work like cities. So we need new methods for building cities together, bottom up, top down, and everything in between. And so we've written a lot about these concepts of, of tactics and how uh, people who are advocates, people who are city leaders, people who are designers, you know, who are shop owners can get engaged in creating change very quickly, very similar, it's very akin to what Fred was talking about with lighter, quicker, cheaper. So we look at tactics and this word tactical as, as defining some of the work that we've chosen to, to pursue at Street Plans, these small scale actions that serve a larger purpose. And so again, as I mentioned, it can be led by a city, an organization, or a citizen. But what's really critical to defining tactical urbanism is intent. From the beginning, you might be starting small, inexpensively, but you're trying to achieve change either through uh, physical design or policy in the long term. It's really about the making piece of placemaking. It's about the physical creation of our own parks, of our own streets and in our neighborhoods. Uh, and we utilize a process uh, that's actually very similar to what was described earlier if you were in the session in the room here just before lunch, I believe as uh, Matthew Lister was talking about it from Gale Studio, is how we can prototype projects. You know, start with an idea, build that out quickly, measure the impact, learn from the success and the failures, and then go on to the next phase. Uh, it's very similar to what you see the New York City um, Department of Transportation doing with uh, Times Square and many, many other spaces around our city. So we've tried to take some of these ideas and test them out in many different kinds of places. In Miami, where we do a lot of work, we've had this vision for a while of uh, you know, transforming this awful nine-lane highway that cuts off the downtown from the central park of, of the downtown area called Bayfront Park. Um, so with a rendering in real time, it's about a week-long demonstration of how we can transform not just one of those six parking lots, but there's actually six of them uh, to create long-term change. 
And you see the kind of activity that happens on the ground. These projects don't happen without partners. This was a project that took $20,000 in foundation uh, funding and worked with 30 organizations in the downtown to make this happen. And what's been inspiring is that this has jump-started a conversation. So that project was 2011. And now that we're in 2016, the federal, not sorry, not the federal, the Florida Department of Transportation has agreed to going from nine lanes down to four with catalyzing you know, these new parks, new, new bikeways, wider sidewalks, et cetera. And we'll be advancing this vision further with the Downtown Development Authority under a new grant to uh, revive the, the Bayfront Parkway, as we called it, into a more permanent space. Uh, similar to this, how we create park spaces very quickly in Penrith, Australia. We worked with a, a city council there and a lot of downtown merchants and community leaders to think about a dysfunctional unused space that after a 18 month long master plan, try to take that plan and implement it immediately. And so to the city's credit, they actually put $40,000 on the table and said, whatever you come up with in the community workshop, we will then go implement and test for six months. If it's a success, it will go on for a year, if not longer. So you see the kinds of changes that happen very, very quickly. So we had the workshop one month um, before these changes were actually made. And of course, after the 12 months, with some tweaks moving forward, the city decided that the pop-up park would not only stay in perpetuity until they got the $3 million to implement in a more permanent way, but they would actually apply this process at another opportunity site in the same city. Uh, this approach we've been trying to embed in communities through a programmatic approach, not just through one-off projects. In Auckland, we worked with a, a number of entities there, including Auckland Council and the Auckland Design Office, to help them uh, make sure their city is comfortable during a time of great transformation. The city is experiencing $10 billion of new investment in the city core, including new rail links, so the streets are torn up, new construction everywhere, and they're trying to use uh, place activation and lighter, quicker, cheaper, as well as tactical urbanism to give citizens and store owners and businesses the way to create these uh, short-term demonstrations and or um, uh, temporary projects to engage uh, the community in the transformation. And the final example from our work is Miami's Ludlam Trail, which is a 6.2 mile uh, vacant rail link um, in, in the center of the region. And that's my partner Tony there, showing at a community group what the vision is to take this space from a charrette environment in November of 2014 in the planning process to actually getting people onto that greenway to experience it, to see it, to give their ideas, to engage. And so starting in November of 2015, we started something called Ludlam Days um, with a bunch of other advocacy organizations. And the point is to prototype this trail, get the community out there and excited and experiencing this new transformation so they can put the political pressure and do the fundraising necessary to work with the county and the other uh, political entities to make long-term transformation happen. And so we also take this to Ludlam Nights as well. Um, and through all these different kinds of projects, we've learned you get away with pretty much anything if you wear an orange vest. So, <laughs> little secret. So what are we doing in New York? as a community? Uh, well, it turns out quite a lot, right? Citizens create their own mini parks around streets. This is in Fred and I live in the same neighborhood. This is one of the most wonderful little micro gathering spaces in Carroll Gardens. Uh, there's no city master plan for that. We have Play Streets, a legacy program from 1909 that's been reconstituted in neighborhoods throughout the city. Uh, this example uh, from Queens, this is 78th Street in Queens, is now a more permanent um, DOT-led plaza started very much with community from the bottom up, testing out new park space. City and neighborhood groups can lead weekend walks, you know, short um, stretches of streets that can be transformed for one weekend into public spaces. City and advocacy groups working with the DOT now on demo plazas. So how do we get that angry community group or community board to actually understand the potential for these projects? Get a lot of smiling faces, people out in the streets utilizing these projects for a day or two. Get them to experience it, see it. Uh, touch it. That oftentimes will de-risk uh, de a lot of these types of projects in the long term and create space for them to get built. On a much larger scale, we have what I think is probably New York City's greatest public space that happens only three days a year in August with the uh, Summer Streets program. This is part of a, a national movement, an international movement called uh, Open Streets. We now have 125 or more different communities in the United States temporarily closing off stretches of street for cycling, walking, public use. And we've seen this all lead, these iterative street designs lead to long-term 
transformation on the ground, testing out the temporary and then moving it forward to the long term. But again, how do we embed this kind of thinking, not just in a place like New York, but in communities all over? So I'm going to talk about this process that we've set forward in one last community, which is called Burlington, Vermont. Um, you might have heard of it recently. There's a certain someone from there who's running for office. But anyways, we're thinking about this process as one and two day demonstration projects are week long and how that feeds into these pilot projects where we do the evaluation and measurement and understanding of the use of the space. If that is a success, how do you then transfer that in interim design so you have benefits accruing to a community, not just for two days, not just for a week or year, but between the short term and the more intensive capital project that might come later. So we've decided to test this approach with a community, um, like I said, in Burlington. Now, if you've been there, it's a wonderful, wonderful town, wonderful Main Street. You can see there, their four block pedestrian downtown. Um, lovely place to go, especially in the summer. Uh, we've been leading a cycling and walking master plan, the city's first. And at the moment, they have a completely disconnected infrastructure um, for those two modes of travel. And we've developed a very aggressive plan with the city. It's a 10-year plan uh, pegged to about $55 million of needed investment to make the plan come to life. That money, that political will, that's not coming um, just out of thin air. You have to create that. And so fortunately on the ground, they have a very strong um, um, neighborhood group, neighborhood associations, and advocacy group called Local Motion. And so as part of the process, we've developed a policy and um, a guide for citizens to lead their own demonstration projects. So if you have a great idea to make your street safer, you want to make a new public space, now in Burlington, you can go and do this. Um, I would love to see you know, New York take this on in a more formalized way, particularly around creating access to more park spaces, whether that's around parks, in parks, or connecting neighborhood groups to get to and from parks with these kinds of transformations that are very low cost and a lot of fun. And in Burlington, they have an incredible history of this. That four block pedestrian street, this is uh, the same street, it's called Church Street, in 1972. These are uh, citizens and business owners going out to demonstrate that that street could become much more oriented to people. And in fact, over the long term, it has absolutely become that way. And we've seen these kinds of images in cities in the United States. Uh, if you go back and look at the 60s and 70s, probably some of the, a lot of the projects Fred was doing uh, earlier on in PPS's days were actually getting this stuff built on the ground. That's led to these incredible lasting changes in our communities. So we decided to test out this policy this past fall, um, working with a variety of community, community members in four different project sites, and connect the events and the implementation to ongoing events. Well, you have a captive audience, something like their art hop, which attracts 10,000 people. You know, do the demonstration projects then, and then be able to engage people in your plan while you're doing that. Protected bikeways, learning what works and what doesn't work on neighborhood streets for cycling. And of course, testing out new types of uh, uh, intersections and treatments, improving access to their, their park systems in their downtown. Um, and what we learned is quite a bit. We learned that cars went a lot slower during this two-day test um, on these uh, corridors where we made uh, temporary transformations to streets. We also learned through talking with the neighbors through implementation while we're out there building and striping and painting that most of the neighbors on this one stretch of street where we were working, they don't actually park there. It's people who come in from out of town who are trying to avoid the downtown meters park there. So it's only through our demonstration process that we learned that as designers and planners, we couldn't just extract that information from afar. And so the short-term plan actually was to remove that parking, and the longer-term plan was to put in a, a raised median and stormwater planning um, to protect the bikeway. So this is something that came out of that process through testing. And what did the city learn? The city learned that short-term action can lead to long-term change very quickly. This is not volunteers in orange vests this time around. This is the actual public works department implementing those changes in the intersections six weeks later. So the question is, we have these plazas and we have these streets and we have these things that citizens are doing in neighborhoods in New York in a really wonderful way. Can we find the equivalent to help Mitch and his team of people implement Parks Without Borders? I think that we can. Um, and so in my neighborhood, you can see this concept of how we get not just the park itself to bring down the gates and the walls and open up Carroll Park, but get people in the neighborhood to it. It's one of our only open space resources for blocks and blocks and blocks. Um, so I think a lot of these approaches of testing these ideas, working with citizen groups to engage them to deliver these projects offers tremendous potential for Parks Without Borders. Um, and so let's look to the streets and uh, change some minds and change some hearts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, Mike. Uh, now, hello, friends. What a great day for parks, and what a great day for New York City. Uh, we've done some hard work today, and now it comes the fun part, the unveiling of the eight winning Parks Without Borders projects. And I do have the envelope right here. It was just passed to me, so. Before I do that, I want to recognize Councilmember Andrew Cohen from the Bronx, a big supporter of Parks. If you could just stand up, Councilmember Cohen. And also, uh, preceding this announcement, if you want to find out more about the Parks Without Borders, we're having a briefing uh, at room L104, and Stephen Leonard, uh, who is the project manager for Parks Without Borders, will be sharing that. Yes. I'm really sorry, I just got a cue up. <laughs> Are we cued? We're cued. Okay, we're cued. Uh, so Stephen was a project manager for the whole Parcel Borders effort, so this is a very exciting time. So last year, Mayor Bill de Blasio set aside $50 million as part of the One NYC for Parks Without Borders uh, for our vision for the seamless public realm. Parks Without Borders has three goals, enhancing, enhancing accessibility, beautification, and community spaces. Parks Without Borders does this by improving the park entrances and nearby spaces. The design concept creates open sight lines, activates edges, and unites park and community activities. Parks Without Borders is already influencing public space across New York City. In fact, we just learned that Parks Without Borders will be honored with a special recognition at the Public Design Commission's 34th Annual Excellence in Design Awards. The centerpiece of this program and our showcase, oh, am I supposed to be advancing these? Okay. <laughs> we have cool slides. No, we had great slides. Yeah. <laughs> we have cool images. We have to get this in sync. So how's everybody doing so far? <laughs> are you in <clears throat> uh, if you while we are trying to get the technology, I don't know if you've noticed, but this summit was not just about parks without borders looking at the edges, but it's also making sure our parks are more inclusive on the people who are participated uh, in this summit. It wasn't just about park designers and landscape architects, but it's about crowdsourcers, placemakers, disruptors, those involved in digital, health, and equity. As we look to parks in the 21st century, it's bringing more voices that share the public realm. It's about that shared space, and so we wanted to use more shared voices and hear from you. So I hope you're enjoying yourself. Uh, I'll share a little bit of news, uh, is that once this uh, summit is done, this is the beginning, not the end. Clearly you hear more about the Parks Without Borders initiative, but we want to continue the conversation. Uh, Parks will now be starting a lecture series where we can continue talking about the good work that we want to do. Uh, we invite you to participate, but you'll hear more about that in the future, so please uh, stay connected. Uh, how am I doing? <laughs> Where are we? We're good, okay. Uh, there we are. All right. So, let me grab this from you, see if this works. Yeah. Yes, it does. Right. Okay, so you're going to take it from there. Yeah, I got it. So, let me back up. So, it is accessible parks, improving neighborhoods, and creating vibrant spaces. Uh, I'm now at slide four, transitioning to fences. So, the centerpiece of this program are our showcase projects, eight parks that will showcase the Parks Without Borders design approach. And that's why we're here today to reveal those winners. And, uh, let me go ahead and get this ready. So before the big reveal, I'd like to introduce the New York City Council Parks Committee Chair, Mark Levine, who helped make today possible. <laughs> so let me have you say a few words before right, we get thank started. You, Mitchell. I'm not even going to touch this computer, don't worry. <laughs> hey everybody, it's a thrill to be here. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, when the mayor announced two years ago that uh, we had selected a prominent urban planner to chair the Parks Department. I, for one, was thrilled because I knew we'd have a leader who understands that parks are integral to the fabric of healthy communities. Um, and this initiative here brings to fruition, I think, that kind of vision and is testament to the value of having a leader uh, with your perspective. You know, I think too often still, 
Um, parks are seen as ornamental often, that they're seen as um, nice for their pretty landscapes. Um, and yes, great parks are beautiful, but they're really so much more than that. Uh, great parks drive everything from public safety to public health to community building in their neighborhoods. And for any of that to happen, we need people engaged directly in life in the park. And we need the streetscape to allow that and to encourage that. And you go around uh, the 1,900 parks in New York City today, uh, many of which reflect the planning views of, of past generations. And it's, it's surprising um, how often we've erected barriers to full community participation in parks. And this initiative is designed to overcome that. And it's important because an individual council member or borough president, which is often the source of funding for um, projects in neighborhood parks, we can muster a few hundred thousand uh, or maybe a million or so. Uh, you can barely re relocate a bench for that kind of budget. Uh, it's, it's so expensive to do anything in parks. The kind of transformative change that the commissioner is envisioning requires a much more robust investment of the type that only the mayor really could bring about. And so uh, when the mayor dedicated, uh, I think it's a 50 million, 40 million dollars, 50 million dollar fund um, to this purpose, uh, I rejoice that we were going to be able to have the kind of impact um, that only can be achieved with strong investment from the department itself. Um, I am dying to hear who the winners are. I know all of you are too. So I'm going to stop talking now so I can enjoy the surprising news along with you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks to all of you. And now, the showcase projects. Now, you all need to get excited because uh, there are a lot of people, I'm sure, in the room that's been waiting for this moment. So you can hoot, holler, tweet, whatever it is you want to do. So these projects are a result of months of community input, which were collected online and in person. We expected about 1,000 nominations for the program. We got more than that. In the end, we received over 6,000 nominations for nearly 700 parks. That is a third of all of our parks. Uh, so that was an impressive response. Drawing from this community input, we took into account community support, park access, and the current physical conditions, and the context to choose the eight winning projects. So now I'm going to go to the envelope and the First winners is Faber Park on Staten Island. This park's shoreline views and beloved skate park are blocked by high edges, which now we will bring down and make it more welcoming to the community. You must go see it has some of the dramatic views of the Bayonne Bridge. It is gorgeous. You must go. Our next winner is... Seward Park in Lower Manhattan. This is the first playground in the United States. We received hundreds of nominations from this park, identifying great opportunities for improvement, especially reconnecting the park's large, walled off and fenced off spaces. And they even came up with a brochure. Uh, if you have to get a copy of it, they were quite impressive. So congratulations, Faber Park and also Seward Park. Our next one, we are back in Manhattan, is Jackie Robinson Park in Upper Manhattan. These high fences, empty sidewalks, and a steep grade cut the neighborhood off from this park. By improving the park edges, we can now open up this cherished, beloved space and its views to the community. So congratulations, Jackie Robinson Park. So we've been to Staten Island, we've been to Manhattan, now we're moving a little bit north to the Bronx, and the winner there is Van Cortlandt Park. <laughs> the public input here has been focused on 242nd Street entrance in Kingsbridge. This major entrance is to one of our flagship parks is ripe for improvements, including new pedestrian approaches and entrances, improved sight lines, and access to the park right near the entrance of the number one train. So congratulations, Van Cortlandt Park. <laughs> We're staying in the Bronx. The next winner is U Grant Circle, Virginia Park in the Bronx. 
It is also a busy transit hub, and that's why we're looking to improve pedestrian connections, access to green space, and add opportunities for vibrant programming and visual improvements. Congratulations, this one really warmed our heart. A lot of great ideas, and so congratulations, you Grand Circle and Virginia Park. We're now moving over to the borough of Queens, and the winner there is Flushing Meadows Corona Park. At the Henry Hudson entrance to the largest park in Queens, there's little to indicate that this park is a park at all at this edge. Here, we'll enliven and green the design to make it more inviting and more evident that this entrance leads to one of the greatest parks in New York City. Congratulations, Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Now we move to the coolest borough in the city of New York, Brooklyn. Sorry, I'm from Brooklyn. All right, and the winner there is Fort Greene Park. In Fort Greene, we're gonna focus on the underutilized north side of the park, and there are many opportunities to activate the plaza areas along the northern edge and encourage a greater use of this park connection to the neighborhood and to this area. Another classic Umstead Vox design, and so we're very excited for those. Congratulations, Fort Greene Park. And finally, our last park, we're gonna stay in Brooklyn, is my home park, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. So, you know, I grew up in this park, but that did not influence us. There were a team of judges. But one of Brooklyn's favorite parks, and how do I know? This park received more nominations than any other park. Commenters focus on the Flappish Avenue corridor, which cuts between the park and the Botanic Garden. This project will improve entrances and access to the park for neighborhoods to the east, making the park more welcoming and accessible. Congratulations, Prospect Park. So we have plenty of work to do. Next, we'll hold community input sessions to learn how best to integrate these beloved parks into their neighborhoods. I now want to introduce one final speaker, Nilka Martell, my rowing paddling buddy. We, we paddled the, the, the Bronx River uh, this weekend. Nilka is the founding director of Give Getting Involved Virginia Avenue Efforts, a grassroots organization that supports Bronx parks and communities. Nilka is an ardent, tireless supporter of public spaces, and I also happen to share, as I said, paddling down the Bronx River this weekend, one of the top 10 best experiences is being Parks Commissioner. Nilka, welcome. Good afternoon. So exciting to be here, among the first to know the park selected to pilot the design for this wonderful initiative. I remember attending a meeting in November at Ronaqua where Commissioner Silver and uh, Rodriguez Rosa introduced the Parks Without Borders. And I was ecstatic to hear about it because uh, the parks that were up there, um, Virginia Park and Hugh Grant Circle, I've lived across the street from those parks my entire life. So that's 41 years that those green spaces have been off limits to the public. Uh, but I am a tour guide, so I want to let you know that it, those fences were put there in 1956. So 60 years. The commissioner came in in three years. He changed something that was there for 60 years. That is really exciting. So Give has worked with Partnerships of Parks and the Parks Department to host It's My Park Day events to activate both Virginia Park and Hugh Grant Circle. But once the events were over, there was no access to the spaces again. When we learned about this initiative and that it was a community-driven campaign where folks had the opportunity to express their concern and nominate a park, we knew that we had to get the word out, and not just us, but other organizations uh, that we do work with. So as the co-chair of the Bronx Coalition for Parks and Green Spaces, we made sure that representative of the initiatives were involved in the 22nd annual Bronx Park Speak Up, which is a full day event very similar to this one. They tabled and they conducted a workshop. 
Community Board 9 held several visioning sessions and included the initiative as well, and the park chair did extensive outreach to make sure that the community was aware and, and involved in the decision making. Give gathered youth, we picked their brains, we asked them what parks in the neighborhood felt less inviting, and we had them think, think of ways of re reconfiguring the spaces to better suit the needs of the community. It's always good when you work with kids, they always have fresh ideas, and it's always great to see them develop this sense of ownership over their open spaces. So after so many years, these eight parks are gonna be redesigned, and you guys should be really excited about that. So I'm gonna leave you with this. It's an exciting time to be alive, leading our parks into the future, and I'm honored to be part of it with all of you. Thank you so very much.